Welcome to Restoration Conversations. I'm Linda Falcone and I have the honor of live streaming today at Museo Galileo in Florence. And I'm here with uh, science historian Natasha Fabri. You're an author, you're a professor of the history of science, and we're so happy to have the honor of being here today. Oh, thank you, Linda. It's a pleasure and a honor to welcome you and our guests to the Museo Galileo. On that note, I'd like to thank, first of all, Museo Galileo, uh, this evening's organizer, together with Calliope Arts. We're always so happy to have the opportunity to uh, investigate women's contributions to history. It's the first time we're actually looking at the history of science. And we're going to do so tonight by um, studying Galileo Galilei in his namesake museum, but also his relationship with a very important figure uh, from the Medici dynasty through marriage, Christina de Lorraine. So you are going to help us tonight, of course, uh, <laughs> Natasha. Uh, but I wanted to start just telling our guests a little bit about Christina de Lorraine. Um, she was actually a Medici uh, granddaughter. She was the granddaughter of Catherine de Medici, who is, who is quite famous, um, who became the Queen of France and then the Dowager. Um, but she married Ferdinando I in 1589, mm -hmm. correct? So can you tell us a little bit about what this Medici wedding would have looked like? Because we're starting tonight with a wedding. Normally, in film, you end with a wedding, but here we're starting with a wedding. What would the Medici wedding, in this case, have looked like in Florence? Oh. Christine of Lorraine arrived in Florence in 1589, and this cosmological model will help us uh, talk about the wedding of Christine and Ferdinand de' Medici. Uh, this is a masterpiece of science, and it celebrates the union between the two families. And uh, you can see inside the Ramillary sphere, the two shields uh, showing the coat of arms of the Medici and the Lorraine family. This cosmological model represents uh, the geocentric universe, so a universe where the Earth is at the center motionless. It's a finite universe encompassed in the most perfect geometrical figure, the sphere, and it's created, of course, by God that you see on so, the top of the sphere. Simona, can you show us God the Father up top? Yeah. So, Natasha, just, just one second so that our, our public can, can get oriented in terms of time, right? You're talking about an Earth-centered universe, okay? And this, but this was built by a scientist, no? by an engineer, a scientist, the chair of mathematics at the University of Pisa, no? Antonio Santucci. And Antonio Santucci was the predecessor of Galileo at the Chair of Mathematics at the University of Pisa and was the cosmographer at the Medici Court. And he created this cosmological model between 1588, just before the wedding, eh, and 1593. And this is a perfect example of the interplay between art, science, and philosophy because it uh, represents the idea of harmony, of perfection, of order, of symmetry, and also of music. Because according to the philosophical tradition, each celestial sirens directs the movement of each planet. So you have here the celestial sirens of the tradition and their voices created a concert. Yes. A perfect concert that is the sonorous dimension of the perfection 
of the universe, of a geocentric universe. So creation is musical. Creation is musical, it's vibration, it's harmony. It's harmony, it's proportion. Right. And the image of God, uh, in this image, God is showing a trinity. So, of course, a theological trinity, but also a scientific trinity composed of arithmetic, geometry, and music, and also a so-called philosophical trinity given by uh, beauty, by truth, and by goodness. Hmm. So these are the values that constitute harmony, harmony. that constitute the cosmos, yeah. right? I, I think it's important to, to go back to the wedding and how this is somehow related by sharing with our audience that Medici weddings were actually almost comparable to what we would think of as a world fair, right? So great works of engineering, great works of theater, um, and in this wedding that lasted a month and a half, right, they had several performances in the Uffizi Theater, etc. And this, although this wasn't particularly created for the wedding itself, it was created in those five years, right? Mm -hmm. In the one year before and four years after their marriage. But there was the idea of linking this Medici wedding to the idea of harmony, right? Because politics had to reflect the cosmos. And you know? it relies on the parallelism between politics and astronomy. So the perfection of the city, the perfection of the laws, should reflect the perfection of the cosmos, of the natural laws of the divine creation. Yes. So it's very important to maintain this uh, parallelism and this uh, dialogue the, between the city and the sky. Interesting. Another really interesting element of Santucci's model is the astrological signs. Okay, and I think everyone will have fun, you no? Know? And if Giancarlo, you can come a little bit closer and we can look at a few going backwards, but here you'll be able to see Gemini. Uh, we're coming up on Gemini, right? We're actually currently right now in Taurus. That's the zodiac sign that we're in today. Uh, and then you'll go forward and see Aries. Pisces, as you Aquarius. Can see, as you can see, this cosmological model is the result of the collaboration between uh, gilders, decorators, smiths, uh, and also of the dialogue, very fruitful dialogue between theory and practice. So a mathematical, a geometrical, astronomical model, and craftsmanship. That is very important in Florence at the time. Yes. And astrology was studied as a sister science. Yeah. You know, it was a sister of astronomy, which is something we don't see today. You know, there's a divorce of these two science, mm -hmm. sciences. But at this time, you have them placed... This is the sidereal belt, mm -hmm. right? And we know now, we know today that the sun moves through the various constellations, right? So it's interesting how we have these, these various elements of science, of religion, as you say, of craftsmanship, as, of engineering, etc. In these seven spheres, uh, this is beech wood, no? It's mm -hmm. wood gilded. Gilded. Right. Natasha, do you want to show us this other document? Yes. And what we should be looking for? Because uh, Santucci was a cosmographer and a mathematician, and he dedicated the treatise on the Ramillary Sphere to Ferdinand de Medici. And he also dedicated another important document, this engraving, to Christine of Lorraine. Uh, this is a calendar, 
and you can see the coat of arms of the Medici and uh, Lorraine family. And also two male figures showing two different globes uh, with a pair of compasses. A terrestrial globe on your right and a celestial globe on your left. And in this room at the Museo Galileo, the armillary sphere is surrounded by terrestrial and celestial globes that belonged to the scientific collection of the Medici family. Right. And I think this principle, and sorry, I'm going to invite the camera back because I just wanted to show them Santucci's model, his cosmological model in the center, in the center of this calendar that you, that you can see. Um, but Natasha, to your point, the fact that we're looking at a constant relationship through the museum of the terrestrial and the celestial, and that's actually also at the core of the story and of the relationship between Cristina and Galileo, which we'll see as we move through the museum. But this idea of the heavens and the earth, the heavens and the earth, and their relationship with each other. Uh, this was a, a really important concept for the Medici, and we can remember Cosimo I. Today we're going to be talking about Cosimo II, who was Cristina di Lorraine's son. But starting from Cosimo I, uh, the first Grand Duke, you have this name Cosimo, Cosmos. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and this idea that the Medicis were somehow going to bring order uh, because they weren't of noble blood. No, they weren't no. of noble blood, and so they, but they were going to bring order, and the way they would bring order would be through very human sciences, right, and by conquering the heavens. Mm -hmm. A sort right? of astronomical legitimation of their power. Exactly, exactly. It wasn't enough, right, just yeah. to just to, um, oh, to move. Another important thing about uh, these uh, cosmological models yes. is that it was a dynamic geometrical model structure because it's a universe machine. So there was it a... could be set in motion. There was a crank. Thanks to a crank. So there and was a crank here. So no, I'm showing, let's let the camera have time to get there. It illustrated the structure of the cosmos and also the movement of planets, the perfect synchrony between each planet. So, Natasha, did these different spheres move in different ways? They each moved independently, independently? inside of this model. Amazing. It really was a but work in of a, engineering. In a very harmonious way. Yes, yes, indeed. Would you like to go into, lead us into the the map room and the globe room, and we can continue our discussion of Rather conquering the globe. Masterpieces yes. of science yes, created by the cosmographer, um, a Venetian uh, cosmographer that was very, very famous uh, for uh, creating um, very huge celestial and terrestrial globes of four meters of diam in diameter mm -hmm. for the king of France, Hmm. Uh, Louis XIV, uh, yes. the, sun, the king. sun king. And this is another example of the dialogue, the interplay between art and science, because they are a very accurate representation, in this case, of lands, uh, seas, uh, uh, coasts, islands, and uh, the representation uh, yeah. replete with the uh, a lot of names of cities, hmm. towns, uh, harbors. Uh, yes. And then and you have here the we have the cosmological okay. model. And uh, they are composed of uh, handwritten mm -hmm. mm, sheets of paper and also printed sheets of paper. Uh, the gorse that you can see so on the top. Just just, of the showcase. just to give our guests a, a moment to uh, understand how these globes were actually made, if you take a look up above where you can see the, these framed 
slices. Those are mm -hmm. slices of the globe, and then they would be glued, glued, glued on, yeah. attached to create glued the globe. Glued on yeah. the ball, the sphere yeah. of wood and papier mache. Right. Uh, and right. Coronelli, the author of this uh, uh, globe, was very renowned at the time, mm -hmm. even because this kind of representation are in between a map and a treatise. There are a lot of description of even temporary celestial phenomena, like new star, comets, uh, hmm. many references to treaties and to astronomers, even to Tycho Brahe, Kepler, mm -hmm. a contemporary yeah. of Galileo. So it's again a dialogue between theory and practice between art and so science. It was like an encyclopedia of the yeah. cosmos that they were building, though, because uh, it had recent of discoveries. Um, a sort of compendium. A compendium, so like an almanac. Almanac. Right. A sort of a almanac. Sort of almanac. A, sort of almanac. Right? a sort of almanac. A sort of almanac. Natasha, we, we're in Tuscany, and a lot of people don't remember or consider the fact that Tuscans were navigators, they were explorers, and we have um, Amerigo Vespucci, who gave his name to the Americas, uh, here, and I want to, this is a photo opportunity, we have the statue of Amerigo Vespucci, but I'm fascinated by this map, okay, because this map is, is an early map, we're looking at a map from, from the end of the 1500s, yeah, and this map shows for the first time Argentina. There Terra Argentia. There we go. Silvery land. Yes, yes. It's, a, it's, it's really interesting because if you consider that the, in 1492, and you're thinking 100 years after the discovery of America, and th this was quite detailed in terms of the geographical masses that they were able to represent, no? Mm. It's surprising. Yeah, but it's also because uh, Livorno in Tuscany uh, uh, was a very one of the major uh, centers in the Mediterranean, and Ferdinand of the Medici established the free port of mm. Livorno. Mm. And even Christine of Lorraine, who inherited a fortune, yeah. participated in the attempt to strengthen the role of Livorno. So because of the economical power of the family relied on the maritime power. Yes. And so it was very important to conquer new seas as yes. well. Yes. I think this element of, of m this merchant mentality, which was, which was quite unique, you know, and I, I do want to repeat, the Medici family was not a family of noble, noble blood. Mm -hmm. They were a banking family, right? And they were very interested in uh, exploration. And here we have a, a, a nautical... Mm -hmm. A pilot book. book. Uh, okay. And we have their coat of arms, right? The Lorraine Both. and Medici coat of arms that we saw in Santinucci's model reproduced here. Um, but if you remember... I had made a, a, a really short reference to Caterina de' Medici, and I just want to mention her now from the point of view of this idea of the Medici's bringing new products, right, to the new world. You think of Caterina de' Medici, who brought to France not only the fork, but also products from the new world, like chocolate mm -hmm. and potatoes and tomatoes, and she wore the first high-heeled pair of shoes in France, and she wore the per first pair of underwear in France. So this idea that the Medicis are somehow conquering new lands, conquering the cosmos, but they were also very much influencers in their yeah. time. And, and open to novelties. Yes. It's very important. Yes. And even to the parallelism between conquer you know, the the seas and conquer the sky and uh, discover new lands on the earth. Yes. And discover a new planet in the sky. So and that's what we're uh, going to see soon. Right. Yes. So we're going into 
a room full of tools and instruments. And if you just want to give us a really quick overview of, of what we're seeing here, I know there's something special you want to look at. But um, what are we, what are we, where are we entering? In this room, we have military and geometrical instruments, like this one, for example. It's a topographical and military instrument, finally decorated. They are a piece of art, of course, because they were conceived and were built to enter the Medici collection, so yes. the collection of one of the most powerful family in Europe. And here we have a selection Mm -hmm. of geometric and military compasses with inscriptions concerning the arithmetic, geometric, harmonic proportions, and so on. Everything that you would need to create. To create, just saw, the, of course, right? the universe. Yes. Because geometry yes. is the fil rouge uh, between uh, the science of war, uh, astronomy, and uh, navigation. Yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, let me show uh, this very peculiar military compass, uh -huh. a dagger-shaped uh, compass, with inside, of course, a, a compass, a geometric compass, a magnetic compass on the top, uh -huh. and with a, a plumb line in the middle. So this is a, it's a, like a weight? Oui, yes. Okay. Very interesting. So, so epitomized and all the mathematical other. calculations <laughs> and then and, and war, of course, <laughs> and and an attack, an attack. Right? So it was. That's interesting because you think of these warriors who were scientists. Yeah. No, because he's carrying around a dagger while he's doing his mathematics. <laughs> that's how I always feel with mathematics. Is someone give me a dagger? I need a dagger for my <laughs> mathematics. But um, yeah, it's it's fascinating. This. This idea of, of conquest. And conquest. Conquer, you know, the idea conquest of conquest. Through, through science. On conquest of collecting nature, natural objects and also artificial objects. So it's the idea what of collection. It's very strong. Artificial, artificial objects. Ob creation. So instruments. Okay. Mainly instruments. Okay. And Galileo continues uh, this tradition. tradition because he creates his own military and geometric compass, and he also writes a book uh, describing the function of this compass, and he devoted, dedicated both the book and the, cos and the um, instrument to Cosimo, the young Cosimo, the son of Cosimo Christine of Lorraine, Cosimo, Cosimo the second. II. Right, right. We're, we're coming upon the man of the hour here, <laughs> right? We have this statue of Galileo, and I think it's an opportunity for us to talk about the relationship between Christine, Christina di Lorena, and the scientist. So we know that one of the Grand Duchess's jobs, one of her duties, was to educate her children. Um, she had 10 children, so I think what's, what, what interests me is she was able to somehow transform this duty into an achievement by calling Galileo from Padua, which at the time was another country, mm -hmm. right, to tutor her sons, to tutor her children, because she was revolutionary in that way. She was interested in science. Yeah. She asked Galileo to be the tutor of mathematics of the young Cosimo. And because mathematics was fundamental, we saw previously in the, in the first room that you, we visited. So mathematics is the fil rouge, as, a, as I said, between different fields. So a, between an array of different fields, and even for theology, that mm -hmm. will be a thorny issue in the right. relationship between Galileo and Christine yes. of Lorraine as well. So that's where and they clashed, or di or did they clash? Or I know that she she was curious, right, as to how Galileo's theories or how Copernicus's theories could coexist with the Scripture, with the Bible. Hmm. Um, but did she take an antagonistic position? Was she? 
What she, was her? She was worried because Galileo introduced a completely different image of the universe. So Galileo advocated the truthfulness of Copernicanism, so of a helios heliocentric system with the sun at the center of the universe right. uh, and the earth revolving around the sun. Okay. So it's a completely different model. So he exactly. revealed a new universe. Right. And especially thanks to his celestial discoveries. Okay, let's, let's take a look at, at, at his celestial discoveries and then we'll go back to this idea of her facing something entirely new, a totally different concept than what we saw with Galileo's predecessor. So what, what can you tell us about Galileo's discoveries and what would they have meant to science and to future generations? What are we looking at here? Uh, here we have the only two extant telescope by Galileo. So he's a personal telescope and the telescope he donated to the Medici. And here at the center uh, of this uh, artistic creation, we have the lens that Galileo donated to Cosimo II. And it was the lens of the telescope through which Galileo observed and discovered the satellites of Jupiter. So he, after dedicated the satellites of Jupiter to the Medici family, and dedicated the book in which he described his discoveries to Cosimo II. Uh, the title of the book is Siderius Nuncius, mm -hmm. that means Sidereal message. message. Sidereal message. But so this lens, which he used to discover the moons of Jupiter, where would it have been placed? Was it, was it in a telescope? In was his it, telescope. In his telescope. In the telescope he used at the beginning in January, February of 1610. Okay. And he pointed this telescope to the sky, to the sky and discovered the satellite of Jupiter. Before, he had discovered a completely new face of the moon. We have here two sketches of the moon discovered by Galileo, which were published inside the Siderius Nuncius. And he discovered a moon very similar to the Earth. Hmm. What do you mean? It, what do you mean? It wasn't anymore a, a perfect uh, and spherical uh, um, celestial body, but it was covered. It was uh, rough, covered with mountain, and so very similar to the surface of the Earth, hmm. with the same substance. So it's very important. Yes. There is a complete uniformity between the sky, the celestial bodies, and the Earth. It's uh, and was an this, important concept. Was, was this shocking for people that a celestial body would have the same or similar composition yep. than yes, the earthly globe? Previously, and even contemporary astronomers, previously they believed that there was a clear cut distinction uh, between two different worlds, mm -hmm. the celestial world, so yeah. the world of planetary movement, of perfection, planets and of the moon, and the sublunary world. So the world behind the moon, that was a world, a realm of corruption, of imperfection. Yes, yes. And this goes back to astrology to as astrology well. To astrology as well. Right, right. With a rich web of influences between planets and Earth. Hmm. It's so fascinating. When, when you, because you, you've said several times that different pieces, different scientific tools or treaties or books or maps were dedicated to various members of the Medici family. So I just wanted, because we have a lot of um, art historians who, who follow the program and who are probably interested in, in being reminded um, Cosimo II had a very short reign. He became 
Grand Duke when he was 19 years old, and he, he didn't have really that lasting legacy, but one element, one lasting element of his legacy was that he allowed Galileo to study, to continue to study without too much trouble, quote unquote, for a time, right? And um, they were fond of each other, right? The same yep. way that we imagine Christine and Galileo were fond of each other. But this idea that Galileo wanted to connect his legacy to the Grand Duke's legacy, um, another element that I just wanted to remind our guests is Cosimo II was, because we're doing with Calliope Arts, we're doing a project, uh, two partners, Calliope Arts and Christian Levitt, a project at Casa Bonarotti in which we're uh, restoring an Artemisi Gentileschi, the allegory of inclination. So we have a lot of Artemisia on the brain, but Cosimo II was the Grand Duke in the period in which Artemisia sojourned in Florence for seven years. And he was actually very supportive of her and commissioned several paintings to her, um, which she didn't complete. And she actually, although she had been paid and she had received a very expensive pigment, etc. She ended up leaving the city on horseback, uh, racing away, <laughs> right? Because she never completed the paintings for him. Um, but he had defended her when she was in debt with her suppliers, etc. Because the Academia dell'Arte del Disegno, of which Galileo and Artemisia were both members at the same time, was also a tribunal, it was a courtroom of sorts. And so when Artemisia was in trouble for not paying her suppliers, Cosimo II gave her a pardon the first time, but not the second time, right? So I just wanted to include that sidebar because sometimes it helps to, to orient ourselves by linking, in this case, science and art history um, together, because something that I have never really thought about, we always think about, um, you know, enlightenment being linked to the artistic world and harmony in the artistic world. And I, I haven't often thought about how important science was in the development of humanism and, and how and somehow this idea of a sun-centered universe, as you said, how that would have been a threat to clerical powers, to ecclesiastic powers. And, and Christina was pro-Rome. Pro no, she was, she was accused as well, and in Tuscan memory remembered as wanting to, as, as acquiescing, Acquiescing. She, she was very zealous. Yes. Very, very zealous. Yes. But concerning art, art and science, let me show you uh, a moment the, um, the frame yes. of the lens. Because Cosimo III, the grandson of Cosimo II, commissioned this canvas to the artist Vittorio Costen. Mm -hmm. And there is a, a summary of Galileo's discovery. We have the satellite of Jupiter, we have sunspots, telescope, uh, uh, the personification of the sun, of the moon. So it's an artistic interpretation of Galileo's discovery and also celebration, both of Galileo and of the Medici family as patron of science. So where do we see, I, I don't know if it's hard for the camera to um, focus on details, right? But you had said the personification of the sun, right? So where are we seeing that, Natasha? Can you, can you point to it? No, or it's just an iconographical, it's an iconographical, iconographical reference. Okay. Was, uh, okay. And this is made of ivory. Ivory. It's oh, very it's precious. Beautiful. And you're even the compass that Galileo dedicated to Cosimo. So discoveries and instruments, because both were very, very important right. in Galileo's mind, in Galileo's research, and of course, for the medicine. Because the discovery would be something, would be a lasting legacy. Of course. For him, but if he could, if he could connect it to the ruling families, you know, that would 
I mean, it would, it would guarantee him economic it's, security. Yeah. And it's a way to celebrate their power yeah. as rulers, but also as a, one of the most important family who collected a very rich and important collection of instruments from all around the world. Oh, Natasha, we need more than an afternoon. <laughs> no? Now, tell us about this letter, because we're going to see an image of Christina. But in 1615, am I right on the date, 1615? After Christina had asked Galileo's pupil about these Copernican theories, and the, because Galileo's studies really supported these Copernican theories, correct? They was, he, he put the math to it in, 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 in common terms, I guess you could say. Um, after her inquiries, right, of, of how you know, viable science could some, somehow be in contrast with the scriptures, he penned a letter, right? The letter to Madame Christina. Mm -hmm. So tell us about this letter, because that's the burning question, right? Uh, this letter is a manifesto uh, of the independence of science mm. from religious, of the importance to carry out research uh, in autonomy, uh, mm. from uh, theological concerns of theological issues. Uh, one of the most famous <laughs> quotations of this letter is that it's important to differentiate uh, how to go to the heavens, so with moral, theology, and how the heavens go. The astronomical description, the mathematical and geometrical description of the universe. So these are two different levels that it's important to trace right. this uh, difference between two fields. So, so this is a quote inside the letter in which he says that the, the Bible, the scriptures, talk about how to go to heaven, right? But he, his works, his treaties, talk about how the heavens go, so how the heavens move, right? And they weren't in contrast. They were just different disciplines they, of knowledge. They have different goals, different we goals. would say today. Yes. And yes. in scientific research, in the astronomical discussion for Galileo, and Galileo stressed this point uh, in, in his letter, uh, astronomical um, research should be led by sensory experience and mathematical demonstration, mm -hmm. not by the traditional interpretation of the Holy Scripture provided by the Holy Fathers. So, two different dimensions, even two different epistemological dimensions, two different books, so the yes. Bibles yes. and the book of nature. I and see. you need two different uh, set of tools to interpret the Bible and the book of nature. Yeah. And the tool for the book of nature, the tools are geometry, you know, he, uh, he wrote uh, this in the Seigneur, the Saggiatore, so geometrical figures like circle, uh, like uh, triangles, to like squares, the book to of interpret nature. the book of nature. Yeah. Otherwise, the book of nature will be only a labyrinth, hmm. a dark labyrinth. Hmm. There is, in this sense, an opposition between the dark labyrinth and the light of science. But he is writing, Galileo in this case is writing to a lay person, okay? He's not writing to another scientist. He's not writing his treaty to another scientist. He's writing to certainly a woman of rank, right? But even to a woman he's writing. And I know that there was some question in his time as to whether this was appropriate, if she could even grasp what he was saying. We know Christina wasn't a scientist. We know she was interested in science and, and had internal questions about the universe and was connected to this whole idea of, co of the cosmos as a legacy for her family and a way they could be remembered in history with her son, Cosimo II, etc. 
But, but was there this controversy of, of him writing to a woman and choosing Christina? Why did he choose Christina? Oh, Galileo wrote um, the so-called Copernican letter yeah. to explain to his interlocutors yes. uh, the reason why he advocated, he supported uh, the Copernican view. And uh, he uh, chose Christine of Lorraine because she was the Grand Duchess of Tuscany. Yeah. She was a very powerful, the most powerful woman yes. at the time. Yes. And she was also a very cultivated woman. So and she was letter, very learned. She was learned. Yeah. And, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, the letter is replete with uh, references uh, to philosophical uh, concept. So um, it's very, very well argumented, yes. uh, the position yes. of Galileo in favor of Copernicanism. And did she respond? to the letter? She didn't. Mm. She didn't. At least we don't have any evidence. Yes. <laughs> and, but uh, I, I, can, I think that it's, um, it was advisable. Yeah, it was recommended. It recommended, she, yes, be, of because course. Because so it's a very thorny issue, the relationship between science and religion, and a possible clash between the mathematician of the Medici court and the church would be... Uh, yeah, yeah. I, so we're talking 1615, right, when he wrote the letter. Um, and at this point, Copernican's sun-centered views in Copernican's book, which you know the name of, and I can't remember, The Celestial Orbs. Um, the Revolution. Yes, exactly. Was... On the was, revolution of celestial orbs. On the orbs. revolution of celestial orbs, exactly. But that was um, put on the prohibited book list, right, at this time. And it was, basically there was a quote that said, prohibited until corrected. Yes, the right? book, the book. Yes. But Copernicanism uh, was condemned as false in philosophy mm -hmm. and against the Holy Scripture. Exactly. So, and they forbade Galileo and other astronomers to teach Copernicanism. But, but let's say 15 years, 16 years would pass before Galileo had his own trial, right? But I, I read that this letter to Christina was used as evidence against him. It was a piece of evidence that he was supporting Copernicanism in the trial 16 years later. Is that, is that accurate to your oh, knowledge? Especially the letter to Castelli. Okay, because there were was several used letters. as an evidence, especially right. the letter to Castelli. Okay. Was, was used. The letter to Christine of Lorraine was translated into Latin 20 years later mm -hmm. and circulated throughout Europe. So it was very important because it conveyed the idea of Galileo uh, to a larger public. So it was an open letter. Open letter. And, and, and Latin was the language of science and the language of religion, too. I want to take um, our viewers to see this. And reproduction. This reproduction. Can you tell us what we're looking at here? This is quite a unique optical toy. Yeah, this no? is a, a reproduction of an optical toy okay. uh, realized for Christine of Lorraine. Mm -hmm. It's composed of uh, sticks, of different sticks having a triangular shape. And when you look at the board, you see the figure of a male of Charles III of Lorraine, the father of Christine of Lorraine. But when you look at the mirror, you discover a completely different figure. Do we see it's the cameraman the in the mirror, or do we see? Do we see? Uh, yes. We do. We see. And, okay, they're confirming. Yeah, it's the figure <laughs> of Christine of Lorraine. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. So this is a an optical toy. Yes. There is the idea of the pleasure of science, of the amusement yes. connected to science. But it also represents the strong bond between 
daughter and father. And father, so. yes. And, and I see, Francesco, that your camera, you're looking at Christina de Lorraine from the other side. So if you want to come from here, Fra, Fra, come, come from here, from this side. Sorry, we're, I'm trying to get it so that the public can see Christina on the other side. Right, okay. So here. Why it's an optical toy? Why why we can see her in the mirror, right? And there is a portrait hidden in a uh, scientific toy. Yeah, and there's this connection between father and daughter. Yeah. So, just a little bit about the family tree because um, I think it's important for people to understand where she was located. We know she was the granddaughter, the favorite granddaughter of Catherine, Catherine de Medici, Medici, as we said through her mother, mm -hmm. so, who was Claude, or Claudia uh, in Italian, who married um, Charles, Charles III of Lorraine. Of Lorraine. Right? And this whole idea of, of marriage and successful marriages, and I, I want to mention it and, and sort of stop there, because for women, marriage was a, a real... Um, source of political power and of agency, right? So Catherine de Medici was really um, interested in placing her children well, and she wanted her son, she tried to have both of her sons marry Elizabeth I, and she wasn't successful, but she was able to have one, her, her first daughter, Elizabeth, marry King uh, Philip II of Spain. And in this case, it was a really successful marriage that she wanted to create between Christine and Ferdinand uh, I. Because, first of all, the Medici didn't pay the entirety of their dowry in, in Caterina de Medici's case. Okay? And she had lands and buildings that she was supposed to inherit from the Medici family. And so Christine was a way to return to Florence, right? It was a way for Catherine of de' Medici to return to Florence. And, and so going back to the whole wedding idea, you know, you had this French princess arriving, right? But she was also a Medici daughter. Um, so it was, they, they got, and they got along very well, um, the two of them, you know, Ferdinand the, the first and, and Christina de Lorraine. But she was, um, considered not a beauty, but very intelligent, mm -hmm. right? And there's always this, this idea of, you know, can the two coexist, um, particularly pre prevalent in her time. Um, but it's nice to see this portrait of her. And I don't know if Simone at the control panel has shown the public the original, because this is a, a, re a, it's copy. a copy where the two are reversed. Smaller. Yeah, a smaller copy. But uh, Simona has a picture to show the public, yep, okay, good, uh, of the original that's, that's in the museum in another hall. In right? the first room. Right, in the first room. So, Natasha, we're going to now go, when, when the first time I came to visit you at the museum, you said there's one piece that everyone sees and <laughs> stops at. Right? And we're going to go there now, and you're going to tell us a little bit, I hope, about it. Right? But what are we looking at here? Uh, this is the finger oh. of Galileo. Okay. That was removed from his body uh, in 1737. Mm. Because when Galileo passed away, uh, he was uh, buried in Santa Croce in a small room. Um, beside the Medici chapel, yep. and after, almost one century later, the body was translated to the monumental sepulchre that we see today, when in, you in enter Santa Croce, in, in Santa Croce, in Santa church. Croce, yes. in Santa Croce Church, when you enter on your left, yes. you, you see, it's an apotheosis yes. uh, of Galileo, and... Uh, Several, we say today, followers of Galileo removed several parts from his body, and uh, one of them is this finger. 
and in order to celebrate him as a hero and as a mafia of science. So there is a, okay, so a secular, yeah, uh, uh, a secular, secular saint. saint. So, so a martyr of science, just remind us, remind us why you're calling him a martyr of science. It's a basic question, but Be, I think it's important yeah, to remember. Because of the clash between mm -hmm. science and religion, uh, because yeah. of Galileo's trial, because he was compelled to uh, abjurate, and he his abjuration, to? his abjuration, he was compelled to deny, to refuse yeah. Copernicanism, to abandon uh, yeah. his studies and Copernicanism, and uh, so they forbade him to publish, and he was condemned to spend uh, the rest of his life under house arrest in the Villa El Gioiello in Acetri. Yes. Isolated, yes, isolated for the scientific community, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. uh, and and he was he was uh, accused of heresy, right? And he was accused of being vehemently suspect of heresy. The what? I'm sorry. Vehemently suspect of heresy. Suspected. It. Okay, so he it's was. It's uh, the the formula. That's the formula. The that formula they used to accuse formula. him. Yes. Yeah. The and final formula at the end of the trial. So was it his sentence? His sentence. His sentence. And did he actually, he was compelled to say, right, that... That he just, didn't believe. That he didn't believe, believe in it. And he, he actually did say he didn't believe yes. in it. But then when he was leaving the stand, did he say, nonetheless, it revolves? Yes, he, he, he denied. He denied. He denied and it. he refused his previous uh, research. At least formally. Okay, so because at he the was trial, compelled, of course. Yes, he was at forced. the end of the trial. But at, so during the trial, he he denied his theories, right? He reneged on his theories. He was say. seventy. Mm -hmm. He was <laughs> yeah. very old yeah. for the time. Yes, and uh, yes, and he was very worried because it's important to bear in mind that the philosopher Giordano Bruno was charged with heresy mm -hmm. uh, and after he was um, uh, he ended up being burnt at the stage in Rome in 1600 yes yes so it was a this was a dramatic moment not only for science and for philosophy but for the culture mm -hmm. in general mm -hmm. so this is going into the inquisition inquisition right Okay, so I, I just, I find it fascinating, Natasha, that, you know, according to the clergy, he was at odds with religion and with spirituality. But then we have this relic, right? And you say a secular saint. So he was sainted in some way, right? The same sort of, you know, body parts, etc. holy, uh, Parts of his body being considered holy. But not for the moment. church, huh? Not for the church, <laughs> not for the church, but, but secularly, as you're saying. But still, it's a, there's a correspondence, you know, between practices of the church and practices um, culturally here. So, Natasha, uh, we have our last couple of minutes in which I wanted to invite our guests, if they have a question, um, to really take advantage of having Natasha here with us. Uh, it's been such a pleasure, and I will repeat that after we after we um, finish our our questions. So I'm just going to grab my phone, see if someone has written in of the people viewing us tonight, and um, we'll, we'll, if you just want to go, with, I'll, I'll follow you that direction. Okay. So let's see here, Natasha, if there's something. Uh, all right, so here we go. It's a million dollar question for you. Um, did Galileo believe in the idea of harmony of the universe? Uh, Galileo received a musical training 
because uh, his father was the musician and the artisan Vincenzo Galilei, and uh, Galilei actually believed in the idea of a harmonious universe, of a ordered beauty, proportion, and uh, a symmetry of the universe, but not in the idea of a harmonic universe, of a concert uh, performed by planets. So the contemporary of Galileo, Kepler, wrote extensively on this topic, but Galileo wasn't very convinced <laughs> about the sonorous harmony but about the idea of a perfect universe com made uh, composed of mathematical proportions, yes, and, yeah. G getting back to Santucci on this point, Galileo wrote that in his later years, Santucci actually became a follower of Copernicanism. No, is that accurate? In the letter to Christine of yes. Lorraine, according to several scholars, yes. Galileo uh, referred to Santucci, talking okay. about a mathematician uh, in Pisa. Uh, but Stan Santucci instead strongly believed in the idea of the harmonic universe. Right. In because, the musical, in the yeah, sense of In the sense universe. of sonorous concert. Yes, yes. Because he envisaged uh, adding uh, uh, st the string of a lute of a musical instrument just the center of the zodiac sign of the so zodiac sphere in order to evocate uh, the reference to evocate the musical structure yeah. of the universe and not only the idea of proportion like Galileo. Will there ever be a chance for that for those spheres to move again? I don't think. No, I don't we think. wouldn't be able to. We wouldn't know how to. It's a temptation. It. Yeah, it would be amazing. But in order to preserve the cosmological model, I think that it's not possible. It would be dangerous for it. Let's see if there's another question, just really quickly. No. Now, it's, there's been a lot of information. So I know that um, our guests are, you know, Probably <laughs> processing, yeah, and digesting this information. I, I really want to thank Museo Galileo for um, welcoming us here today. I want to thank Calliope Arts as well. It's always such a pleasure to um, be able to come into museums and speak with uh, scholars and, and, in this case, science historian um, Natasha Fabri. It's just, a, it's just a pleasure and an honor. I also want to thank um, Bunker Film, the, the men behind the cameras, and, um, and the Florentine, our media partner. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your time and for your visit. Grazie. My pleasure. Grazie.